Welcome back to the second video about this ASUS P4B motherboard, which suffered from a few bad capacitors. I have already removed 7 bad capacitors which are known to have a manufacturing defect. Unfortunately, it is about 20 years too late to file a warranty case, so it will be up to me to rescue this board. If you're interested in the first video and see more of the story, then I suggest to have a look at the video popping up in the top right corner. We are also going to renew the thermal paste of the north bridge to avoid potential thermal issues. But let's get to the stars of the show. The replacement capacitors have finally arrived. Instead of electrolytic capacitors, I went with solid state models. They are supposed to be superior to the electrolytic kind, but as you may know, I am no expert. Some of you already informed me that there are cases where you should not replace an electrolytic capacitor with a solid state capacitor. If you have the expertise and knowledge in what cases you should not switch the type of capacitors, please share it below this video to help others looking for information. Also, if you want to avoid headache, buy your branded capacitors from a reputable source. And if you want to avoid headache that may turn into a full-blown migraine, then I suggest to check out PCBWay.com if you're in need of 3D printing or PCB manufacturing services. I finally placed my first order with PCBWay to 3D print some CPU trays, because I got tired to have all my CPUs flying around in a drawer. Thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this video and check out PCBWay.com if you want to turn your ideas into reality. No CPUs were harmed during the preparation of this ad spot. So where were we? Ah yes, branded capacitors from a reputable source. Regrettably, or perhaps fortunately if you prefer to see it like that, I have a tendency to live on the edge, as I purchased unbranded capacitors from an unknown supplier via one of China's largest online retailers. The old capacitors were rated for 6.3 volts. The solid capacitors are rated for 16 volts and are supposed to have the same capacitance as the originals. I tested each capacitor with a component tester to avoid any surprises. They all reported as capacitors, having a capacitance close to what is printed on the top. I need 7 of them to complete today's project. Before I start with the capacitors, I am going to install the heatsink for the north bridge. The old thermal solution was a sticky tape, which I could remove using isopropyl alcohol. After more than 20 years, I have my doubts that the heatsink made proper contact with the silicon. A small blob of thermal paste should be an adequate replacement to keep this chip cool. And it will also make it a lot easier for future maintenance. Now we can finally focus on the capacitors. It should be an easy task, don't you think? Just put the new caps in place and solder them to the board. But here is already the first obstacle I encountered. Have a look at the silk screen, the white markings on the surface of this ASUS P4B motherboard. If I wouldn't have checked the placement of the original capacitors, I would have installed the new capacitors with a negative side towards the filled half circle. Like it was with a Gigabyte board which I recapped many months ago. On this board, you can actually see that Gigabyte uses a plus symbol to indicate the orientation of the capacitors. And here, the filled half circle indicates the negative side. ASUS on the other hand, does not provide descriptive polarity markings on this board. So let's follow the orientation of the old capacitors and place them with a negative terminal facing away from the filled portion of the circle. You could also use a multimeter to verify which side is negative or ground. I actually did that, just to make another sanity check. And yes, the filled area is indeed the positive terminal. For 3 of the 7 capacitors, the holes on the board were free from solder. The other 4 however, still had some solder stuck inside. Unfortunately, I do not have the footage of me struggling, but it was way more difficult than I thought to get those remaining 4 capacitors installed. I ended up using my hot air station set at 300 degrees and slowly heating up the back of the board. This board has big copper planes on the front, back and probably internal layers as well. I completely underestimated how well those copper areas transfer heat away from your solder spot. Anyway, after about 30 minutes and many tries, I finally ended up with a recapped board. Lesson learned I guess, and all without warping the board. What do you think? How do the new capacitors look? Do they suit this motherboard? And yes, there are still a few other electrolytic capacitors that seem to be part of the same power delivery system. The question is if we have to replace them as well. Looking online, you will find all sorts of answers to how long electrolytic capacitors will last. 
Some say 12 to 15 years, others say 40 years is not uncommon for good electrolytic capacitors. I guess it depends on usage, operating temperature and quality. Today we won't replace those capacitors, and to be honest, I probably wouldn't replace them at all given the visual condition. However, it may still be an interesting topic for a future video. Great, I think we are done. The north bridge has its heatsink back with fresh thermal paste and the capacitors are in place. I guess it is time to install the remaining components. As CPU, I am using a 1.6GHz Willamette Pentium 4 which uses a manufacturing process of 180 nanometers. This CPU with its 42 million transistors has 20 kilobytes of level 1 cache, 12 kilobytes for instructions and 8 kilobytes for data. I never had a Pentium 4 system back then, so this cache configuration is new to me. And yes, this is the correct amount of thermal paste. Adjusted for inflation. Now we need some memory. 256MB of SDRAM should be enough for today's test. This memory is capable to operate at a frequency of 133MHz. As graphics card, I'm using a GeForce 2MX, which you may have seen in some of my videos before. In the meantime, the card is now equipped with a proper power connector for the fan. The CMOS battery should also not be missed. And now we just need the speaker and the switch to. <sighs> what in the world? Where are the pin headers for the front panel connections? The manual for my revision 1.03 clearly shows that the connector should be there. Surprisingly, the connector adjacent, labeled V panel, is not even drawn in the motherboard layout. Long story short, after some research, I found out that the V panel is just a shortened front panel connector port. Unfortunately, Asus forgot to mention the pinout in the manual. So, here it is. Maybe it will be useful to someone looking for this information. I will probably add the missing pin headers someday. At least those have the pinout printed on the board, so I don't have to look for the manual each time I want to connect a switch or a power LED. Ugh, finally, we are now ready to switch on this board for the very first time. And we are greeted with a GeForce 2MX boot message. It's working! This board seems to have been part of a Max Data personal computer. Here is a bit of information for my German viewers, who may remember some of the companies I will mention now. At the time when this motherboard was released, Max Data's majority shareholder was Vobis, another IT service provider and distributor, which was fully owned by the Metro Corporation. Max Data also distributed monitors under the brand name Bellinea. I wish I could figure out what was the last time this board was put to use. It might have been as long as two decades ago. Since there was no battery in the board, I have to configure a few settings in the BIOS first. But then, I want to bring your attention to one of the very unique features, which I have never seen in any other motherboard before. This board is equipped with an onboard sound chip and allows you to redirect whatever would go to the PC speaker to the line out of the onboard sound. This is an excellent feature if you prefer not to hear your PC speaker beeping at you, but instead have the sound play through the loudspeakers on your desk. In the BIOS, you can enable the speech post reporter. According to the manual, this is an exciting new feature that provides friendly voice messages and alerts during the power on self test. You will hear messages informing you about the system boot status and causes of boot errors, if there are any. It is even possible to customize those voice messages with the provided voice editing software. I am not going to edit those voices today, but let me know if you would be interested to see more about this. For now, let's listen to the original voices that were put on this board many many years ago. No IDE hard disk detected. System completed power on self test. <laughs> That's an interesting feature. While it's undeniably a unique feature of this board, I can imagine that the voice messages become bothersome rather quickly. Please share your thoughts in the comments and let me know if you had a board with a feature like this. I believe such boards are relatively uncommon. And there are even more voice messages. Here are all the messages documented in the manual. Computer now booting from operating system. CPU fan failed. No floppy disk detected. System failed memory test. No CPU installed. Anyway, let's set up Windows and see if the board is stable. Instead of Windows 98, I decided to use a newer operating system. Windows XP was released while the first Pentium 4 CPUs were already on the market. 
Given that the minimum CPU frequency requirement is 233 MHz, our Pentium 4 should easily handle this operating system without breaking a sweat. Once the files were copied and the installation was about to start, my excitement to see the Windows XP desktop was cut short. I was greeted with this unknown hard error. Presented what resembles some sort of a minimalistic blue screen. Several attempts to install Windows XP eventually failed with the same error message. Windows 98 did install without issues though, but initiating an upgrade from Windows 98 to Windows XP also failed, this time with a full featured blue screen. And although I was able to resolve the issue eventually, I came across many suggestions including changing the hard disk and replacing the faulty memory module. As it turns out, it were the IDE cables I was using. Until now, I was using my SD to IDE adapters on older motherboards, which do not support Ultra DMA modes. A quote from Wikipedia explains, Modes faster than Ultra DMA Mode 2 requires an 80 conductor cable to reduce data settling times, lower impedance and reduce crosstalk. It has been quite a while since I used those 80 conductor cables, but I do not remember running into this issue. I guess I just followed instructions back then and never connected any of my UDMA boards with a 40 conductor cable to hard disks. After replacing the 40 conductor with 80 conductor cables, I was able to install Windows XP without issues. So no, my cheap no-name capacitors did not cause instability. And the admittedly excessive amount of thermal paste did not cause the CPU to overheat. I'm happy that this board works, since I never used this platform before. Instead of a Pentium 4, I was on Team AMD, at that time with an Athlon XP 2400+. Nevertheless, I'm looking forward to test other compatible CPUs using this board. It should support CPUs up to a clock frequency of 3GHz and a rated frontside bus of 400MHz. The board is working very well so far and I probably wouldn't touch it anymore, meaning I would not replace the remaining 3 capacitors of the power delivery circuit. However, to satisfy your and my curiosity, I will probably make a video about it anyway. But this will be something for the future. For now, this is all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed the content and you're happy to see this board working. Don't forget to let me know if you knew about the talking BIOS feature or if you even owned one of those boards. Also, like and subscribe to help this channel grow. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.